Hello and welcome to another episode of Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with Arusha Pires, who joins me every week. He is an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. How are you doing, Arusha? I'm doing well, Justin. Happy yeah, Marketing we... Correction Day, should I say. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that's that's what we, we're always so happy when we go to Marketing <laughs> exactly. Correction. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's something that we'll talk a little bit about today. And, of course, we have a great guest to talk to us about that. I mean, this was a Fed Day, September 20th, uh, 2023. And who better to come on and chat with what's going on with the market and some learning lessons than David Keller. We can't forget that CMT at the end of your name, because that's important. Um, and he is, of course, is the chief market strategist at charts, uh, stockcharts.com. Welcome back to the show, David. Yeah, good to see you guys, Arusha, Justin. Thanks so much. Ah, good to have you on. So let, let's get right into it. I mean, this this market has not been easy. Um, for, for a while, there's been the overhang of the Fed uh, mm -hmm. raising rates, and they didn't do that today. But I don't know. I did. Did people finally get the message that maybe they're not going to cut rates this year? Is that is that what happened? <laughs> what's what's going on in your opinion? I mean, I hope so. It, <laughs> I mean, and, and it's funny that you know I was I was taught. I mean, it's classic Jesse Livermore quote that there's a time to go long, a time to go short, time to go fishing, right? Or there's yeah. time to be long, time to be short, time to sit on your hands. And I and certainly leading into this Fed meeting, it certainly felt like that um, in the short term, just in the last couple of days, but certainly over the medium term, right? Since the August peak. We've been sort of in wait and see mode. I mean, a lot of the indicators that I look at are kind of neutral at best. They're not the world's ending kind of bad, but they're certainly not as extremely bullish as they were before. And I feel like for every alphabet that's been in a good uptrend, there are just a bunch of names that are sort of consolidating. Um, you know, I, with the Fed meeting today, I think I think the 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 implication is less that they're how much they're going to raise rates but more the prospect of rates remaining elevated and what it will take to actually get inflation down to some arbitrary bogey that uh, Powell and, and crew have set. And I, obviously, it, it, the, the less, lesson I heard or the, the message I got was that we're not done with that yet, that mm -hmm. more will most likely come between now and year end. And I, just, I think about how much higher rates weigh on growth stocks and how big growth stocks are in our benchmarks. So yeah. that, that that simple you know analysis tells you that I think there's limited upside for for benchmarks until we kind of get through this tightening cycle, which we're obviously not not through yet. Mm -hmm. So David, how how many? So you mentioned some of these indicators and, and they were neutral. What what are uh, you know maybe just from kind of a more general point? What what are what are some of the indicators that that you use to uh, get a gauge on the market? Yeah, so I, I think it starts with analysis of price. So the main thing I would look at would be the S and P and the Qs and just the pattern. I always tell people, I you know, we were talking about the Fidelity chart room before Arusha that we've both been able to spend some time in. And for my years in the Fidelity chart room, one of the, the main benefits was taking a couple steps back from the wall and just looking at the overall trend. And when I take a few steps back from the S and P five hundred, I don't see a bullish trend at the moment. I see a bullish trend maybe with a big question mark, if not a bit of a, of a sideways trend, because we've put in lower highs. And it's not just the S&P that's put in a lower high. It's a lot of other things as well, right? A lot of things that had really good runs June, July, August, and now have attempted to make a new high and have failed to do so. And so that simple analysis tells you that at least something might be changing, what I call a change of character. Um, mm -hmm. Other things I would think of would be breadth analysis, right? And if you look at, you know, percent of stocks above their 200-day moving average, it's basically right around 50% right now, which means it is a coin flip. If you take a random S&P stock, is it above or below its 200-day moving average? And to me, that just speaks to the indecision, that speaks to the uh, to the, the story or the narrative that some stocks are still holding up okay. For every alphabet, there's a paramount just in a clear downtrend. And in the end, that nets out to a market kind of choppy sideways, particularly even just with those leadership names, with the Magnificent Seven or the Fang stocks, whatever you, we want to call them these days, there are some charts that look just fine. And then there are Teslas and Apples that are gapping lower and testing key support levels. So I think at the end of the day, again, that nets out to benchmarks sideways until proven otherwise. Going back to the percentage of stocks above the 50 day for the S&P 500, are, are you also taking a look at maybe the S&P 500 and its own 200 day moving average? Because right now it's still a, a good amount away. Like, uh, it's yeah. uh let's see it's uh 5.1 percent above that so it's pretty yeah. long ways down 
So what's so interesting is the more you look at any cap weighted measure, it's farther and farther away from its S&P, right? So if you look at the equal weighted S&P, like the RSP and ETF, it's a lot closer to its 50 day moving okay. average. If you look at other equal weighted measures, you know, if you look at the broader New York Stock Exchange, kind of closer and closer. And so, again, it speaks to the resilience of some of those largest names and their ability to drive the indexes higher. And, and again, my, my time spent with institutional investors, there's one of many takeaways I got out of was, you know, beating a benchmark. If you're looking at the S&P 500, it's about understanding the benchmark. It's not about picking good stocks. It's about picking good stocks and recognizing the construction of the benchmark. Our benchmarks are very growth oriented. They're geared towards the largest companies. And so the top 10 stocks are probably the same weight as the bottom 400 would be my guess about the weightings at this point. That's a pretty significant weight. So again, Alphabet looks great. It's still okay. It's pulled back today, but overall still in an uptrend. And so as long as that happens, um, you know, the, the, the downtrend in the markets is not, is not getting uh, too painful, but I'm seeing less and less alphabets and a lot more stocks that are putting in lower highs. And I think that's the cause for concern. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the RSP, that equal weighted S&P 500, because speaking of a 200 day moving average line, you know, we're, we're underneath it uh, as of today. Uh, yeah. We undercut that August 18th low. Um, the RSP looks very different from, you know, the Qs and even the S&P 500 itself with those big mega cap weightings that you were mentioning. And let's also just go ahead and throw in the Russell 2000 for good measure, because mm. that one is not looking so great. So, um, you know, what is it that you're kind of taking from this? You know, do you start uh, putting less weight on the weights that are so heavy and kind of go more towards those equal weights and the, the you know, where the market cap is not? Uh, as big of yeah. a factor. So here's the thing. If you look back at major market tops, which I know you guys and, and the team at IBD better than anyone probably does a great market history lesson at looking at significant terms of what are the characteristics of good stocks. O'Neill probably the best at that uh, over time. But if you look at major market tops, usually at the end of that bullish run, you get people doing two things, you know, getting to more defensive areas of the market mm -hmm. and parking in the big mega cap names, the high dividend pairs, things that imply stability and imply that their ability to weather uncertain times. And I think the blue chip safety trade of the day is not Pepsi or Walmart anymore. It's right. Apple and Amazon and those it's names. Like if anything's going to keep working, it's Alphabet and Amazon, these names that will be able to weather these storms, it's not emerging tech and things that are already struggling. So what concerns me is when everything else starts to rotate lower and those are still doing well, it's like the chart of Pepsi in 2007. I remember vividly watching the market roll over, watching small caps roll over. And there's Pepsi just making new highs toward the end of 2007. I'm thinking, OK, that doesn't make me feel great. You know, it's like good that <laughs> right. stock's going up. But it's like, is that really what I want to happen right now? And that's what concerns me now is I think the the way that the market gets defensive, you're starting to see sectors like utilities and yeah. REITs starting to pop up a little bit. But for me, it's more rotating to the relative safety of the mega cap name. So good that they're going up. But again, the fact that the average stock is, has, uh, has already broken down or is doing so, lack of participation in small caps, those are not, those are not bull market uh, bullet points for me to observe, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you you almost you did beat me to the question I was going to ask with, with the defensive stuff, uh, yeah. because the staples, the staples have been underperforming for so long. Yeah. And and so I, I, that's what I was always wondering is like, OK, look, sure. OK, you have the Magnificent Seven, yeah. but it, why are staples still going down at, at this point if. You, yeah. you can't have everything in Apple, can you? I mean, if you're if you're a, a large <laughs> right. audience, you can. I mean, might not be a good idea. Yeah. I, I wouldn't advise that for sure. Right. Um, no, I, I so I tend. It's probably oversimplistic, but I tend to think of sector distribution in like three general buckets. You have the growthy offense, which I think is what a lot of people think of as offense, like technology, consumer discretionary type of sectors. Um, you have pure defense, like utilities, REITs consumer staples that you really only own when you'd want to not own other things. That's sort of like your, you know, hide out and gather some income. But then there's that third bucket, sort of the cyclical sectors like energy, materials, industrials. If you look at the things that are really starting to emerge, you're seeing a rotation, I think, from a lot of technology like semiconductors ro rotating lower, energy rotating higher, oil services rotating higher, gold stocks actually starting to bounce this week, the GLD or, you know, spot gold starting to turn higher. So there are areas of the market that are working. I think it's just we may need to reset ourselves as investors to remember that in a rising rate environment, 
it's often not the growthy stuff that tends to materialize with the biggest gains. It's the cyclical leaderships, things like energy. And the problem is for our benchmarks, those are not a big enough weight to make our benchmarks do anything. Right. Um, they're sort of a rounding error, right? And so if the growthy stuff is going to stop, I think you could have that similar feel to what you had in the first half of like 2022, where energy stocks were doing great. I mean, they were doing exceptionally well, but you wouldn't have known that looking at a chart of the S&P or the NASDAQ because they're just not a, a big enough uh, a weight. And I think you're kind of seeing some signs of that too. With energy looks, I mean, pulled back recently, but still in pretty good shape, I would argue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, we kind of touched on it earlier when we were talking about the Fed, um, but maybe we should look at the 10-year Treasury yield, which mm. is um, 0TNX and MarketSmith. Um, you know, we, we're kind of butting up against these highs, uh, you know, like not, not just recent highs, but I mean, highs going back quite a ways. And uh, as, as you've mentioned a number of times, uh, I, I watch a, a lot of your stuff and, you know, look, you know, higher rates does not kind of go for the growth, uh, the growth picture. Those two usually, you know, one wins over the other. So, right. uh, it, I mean, it seems like we keep on trying to butt our heads up against this, you know, this level. Um, but what, what do you, are, are you putting this macro picture on there and waiting for something to happen on the 10 year yield chart? to kind of inform yeah. you? Really good question. I, I would 100% agree with your with your discussion about how rising rates I and mean, higher rates, they're just such a headwind for growth stocks. And I think there's a whole whole cohort of investors. And I started investing in around the year 2000. So I've never really experienced a rising rate environment. I've read about them. <laughs> right. and I've yeah, talked yeah. to people about them, but I, that's not part of my own experience. In my experience, mm -hmm. bull markets are driven by growth stocks. So it's either do you own bullish growth stocks or do you not? And I think now we're in a different environment. We just had Ralph Akampora out to our offices uh, last week, which was, which was a ton of fun. I mean, he's just a, an encyclopedia of awesome right. stories yeah. from, from his career. But he was talking about buying an apartment in uh, New York City and rates had come down. His mortgage was like a 10% mortgage. And he was so thrilled to get such a great rate. He's like, I hug and kiss my broker for giving me such a great rate. And it's like, we have to remember that 4.5% on the 10-year seems extreme if your reference point is 0 0.7, 0 0.8 or something a couple years ago. But if you look at the you know, last five decades, 4.5% is actually pretty low. It's below average for, for yeah. the longer period of time. So I don't think we are all as a group prepared for what rising rates mean. And again, I, I think it's not just a one month or one year thing. I think this is a period where you see rates overall being elevated. And there certainly could be some noise there. But higher rates just tend to be better for certain types of stocks and in an environment we've not really seen. And, and many newer investors have never seen. I think that will mean people are under positioned for it and under prepared for it. And I think that often provides a good opportunity. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, with some of those periods that you're talking about with those higher rates, you know, those energy stocks and some of those cyclicals were a much bigger percentage of the, you know, of the indexes. So they may be reflected a little bit more of that, that, that yeah, strength we, there. It's so funny. And I, you know, when you look at uh, something like the S&P or even the Dow or, or anything over time, remember the further you get back to the left, the further you get behind the current data, the more and or the less and less like the current data actually looks, right? So yeah. The S&P 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, if I remember in 1960, the biggest sector in the S&P was materials. And currently that's like two to 3% of the S&P. Yeah. So if you're looking back at market performance in the 60s, in the 80s, when I think it was energy, different market environment altogether, different market structure, different market participants, different motivation. Um, but in the end of the day, what's great is human behavior is still very much what I think drives asset prices. So that is in some ways very much universal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Arusha, it seemed like you, were, you had something that you were gonna say. Yeah, so well, yeah, with the, I, I think you bring up a good point with the, the benchmark. It, we could see that shift back mm -hmm. to, and all of a sudden, I and mean, you mentioned it before, like, a lot of us have been investing for 20 plus years or whatever, <laughs> not back in the late 70s, early 80s, when this was the type of environment. And so it, it very well, if, if that happens, it could catch all of us by surprise. And, and again, I, for me, it reinforces. And again, I think you guys have always done such a fantastic job at IVD about marrying the fundamental, the technical, the macro is sort of these different. And I would argue the behavioral, what happens between your ears is maybe a fourth important pillar to your process. But thinking about 
you know, the the reality of what the charts are telling you. The charts are not telling you what should happen or what could happen. They're reporting on what is happening. So a lot of times something like energy will do very well. Gold stocks will start to rally and we can debate why that should or should not happen all the way up. And I remember vividly one of those times when gold just started ripping. And I remember arguing with a portfolio manager about why gold shouldn't go up. And I just kept saying the market doesn't care what you think gold should do. It's like it's going <laughs> higher. Like that is what's happening. So let's be a part like let's participate. Let's not fight it. So I think this is a really important time to focus on what's working and certainly what is starting to work that maybe has been underperforming. Energy is a great example of that type of theme that comes out. I think a lot of people are just not ready for it. Focus on the patterns that emerge and the breakouts that play out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I, well, I just quickly pulled up both uh, XLE and GLD on mm. monthly charts and yeah. they are both approaching all time highs yeah. building these multi like a multi decade type of bases mm-hmm. gosh if they if they emerge out of those on pretty good volume there there's your character change and, and maybe that's when they become bigger weights in the S&P yeah, and it's so easy arusha in this kind of environment i feel like there's a short termism that's just natural right so yeah. we're we're focusing way too much on what happens today on a fed day between 2:30 to 4 p.m. and then think <laughs> Let me make major long-term decisions based on that, right? Make short-term decisions on short-term data, make long-term decisions on long-term data. And some of those themes that evolve, it takes quite some time. And there are all, all, often some volatility, there's some noise along the way, but really good time to revisit weekly charts, monthly charts, and think about how some of these trends have evolved, not just this week or this month, but over, over longer periods. Mm-hmm. Well, when we come back, we're going to get into a little bit of this uh, price pattern analysis. And you've got three phases that you can kind of use to really analyze any price pattern. So we'll get into that when we come back. Trading Tesla, sometimes you get the bear. Sometimes it gets you. Single stock daily leverage and inverse ETFs from Direction. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's objectives, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus at Direction.com. Read carefully. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Paris, who joins me every week. He's a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. And we're welcoming back to the show, David Keller, CMT, and chief market strategist over at stockcharts.com. And he was just mentioning that he had Ralph Alcampoor on his show, uh, The Final Bar. Uh, it was The Final Bar that you had him on, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah so great. not too long ago. Um, Ralph Alcampoor, of course, is the uh, the godfather of technical analysis and the, the head of the CMT Association. He created the CMT Association. So uh, a really great guy and someone who we have had on the podcast along with Tom Dorsey. So uh, let's get right into it, David. Um, you, you mentioned these price patterns and particularly the phases, because I think what happens with a lot of people is you want to be early, right? You want to be the one that kind of caught the idea first and everyone follows you. And, you know, you can say, look at where I got it and, um, you know, pat yourself on the back. But that's, you know, the the the, the lowest price isn't always the best price. So mm-hmm. what is your process for really analyzing price patterns? Yeah, and there's a book, uh, it's called How We Know What Isn't So, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it talks about how, you know, it's more behavioral kind of mindset psychology, it's similar to like a Danny Kahneman type of, you know, thinking fast and slow, just about how we're wired. And unfortunately for our investing, you know, journey, why we're wired to make poor decisions. And, and the reality is we often see way more patterns than there actually are. And that's I think how we're wired as humans, we're, 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 we are designed to look for patterns and, and detect relationships because that's a survival skill, right? Is recognizing mm-hmm. when something is good or bad and, and what you need to do as a result of that. But I think for investors, unfortunately, a lot of times we, we tend to be so anxious to find a pattern. I often will get asked, it on my own, asked on my own show, is this a head and shoulders top? Is this a cup and handle pattern? And Unfortunately, like 80 to 90 percent of the time, the answer is no, because here's, you know, here's what you're missing. No, it's not following this rule. No, it's not an ideal pattern. So I tried to take all of those conversations I'd had and boiled it down to a set of three steps or what I call it, three phases. And I think for any sort of price pattern, and I'm, we're going to use a head and shoulders top as an example, because I think there's a potential head and shoulders top uh, forming for the S&P right at the moment. But thinking of those three phases, right? And so the first phase is called the uh, the setup. Basically, I think there's a pattern. And this is where a lot of people start, but then they immediately skip the other two phases and they just make a decision based on that, right? And I think if I could encourage anything, be patient. 
and recognize that they are three steps that happened in order. So don't jump just because you saw the first one. So, you know, on the S&P 500, right, there is a peak surrounded by or a high surrounded by two lower highs. Uh, and it's pretty clear. I think sometimes it's not as obvious in this case it really is. If you take, you know, the peak in August, you take the lower high to the left in June, you take the lower high to the right, right around Labor Day, you get this head and shoulders top. Uh, and the idea with the head and shoulders top is you have an exhaustion point, right? The market's been rallying and all of a sudden you make that lower high and that suggests that the buying power that got you to that point, to that, uh, that, that eventual high is starting to dissipate and there aren't, there isn't enough willingness to push the price back to retest those highs. But what's really important is not the fact that you see that combination of the head and the two shoulders, which I would say is the setup. The second part is the is the trigger. And, and in the case of a head and shoulders, it's the neckline. What you're really supposed to do is connect the lows, right? Look at the low between the head and the left shoulder, which is kind of that low from uh, like around June, and then take the low between the head and the right shoulder, which would be that initial pullback in August. You draw a trend line connecting those two lows. That gives you the neckline. That gives you the point where you want to sort of uh, you know anticipate support. And that basically shows you that the pattern is being uh, is being created. Once you break the neckline, that's when the trigger has been validated. So until you actually break the neckline, it is not technically a head and shoulders pattern. The best you can say is call it a potential head and shoulders, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a head and shoulders forming. Right. Once you hit the trigger, then there's this third part, which I would describe as the follow through. And a lot of my mentors, people like John Murphy, who wrote the first book I ever read on technical analysis, um, you know, Martin Pring, who, who a prolific writer on technical analysis. Edwards and McGee, John McGee, right? Some of the early practitioners wrote a book, you know, early uh, sort of mid 20th century about technical analysis. They all talk about price patterns and the importance of follow through. And other, other people that I follow, like Larry Williams and Tom DeMarc, who I've worked with over my career, all have something in their toolkit about follow through, right? Once you have a signal, once you break a level, that's not enough. And a lot of times we get whipsawed because we see a pattern happen and then we immediately take a trade the market goes against us and we we miss it, right? And we feel, you know, we kick ourselves because we feel like it just didn't work. The reality is you didn't follow, you know, wait for that confirmation, which is that third step. You get some sort of follow through, some indication that that wasn't a fluke, that there's an additional movement in that direction. So when I'm looking at the chart of the S&P, I would say we've definitely set it up, right? It's clear that there's a potential head and shoulders top. You can see the head and the two shoulders. It's a pretty clear pattern. And now you're looking at the neckline, which is below current levels, right? We're not we're not actually breaking that uh, yet by my read. It's around 4,350 or so, just below 4,400. It's kind of where we're at uh, here in uh, mid-September. S&P goes below 4,350. That would violate that neckline and complete the second point, which are the second phase, which is called the trigger, which means then you can say that is a head and shoulders top. It's now happened. And then it's the follow through. You see additional distribution because what you want to avoid is people wait for that support level. They buy in and then it just goes right back up. And you look back at the chart of the S&P in like the mid 2000s, early 2000s, teens, you will find what's called a failed head and shoulders top where the market does a head and shoulders. It never breaks the neckline and then just keeps moving higher. And uh, Mike Epstein, who unfortunately no longer with us, but um, one of the uh, one of the people that actually connected the MTA from a New York society to the group of technical analysts up in Boston. There's your technical analysis history lesson, I guess, in the industry. You had the buy side uh, practitioners up in Boston at Fidelity and Wellington and Putnam. You had all the sell side guys in New York. Mike Epstein actually helped connect the two and formed the modern CMT association. Uh, I would argue Mike taught at uh, MIT with Andrew Lowe for a number of years. And he thought the failed head and shoulders top was one of the most significant patterns to look for because it showed that that follow through never occurred, right? It never actually had the distribution that people were expecting, and often there's a bunch of buying interest that tends to uh, tends to come in. So with the with the S and P 500 now, I think is it forming a potential distribution pattern? Absolutely. Is it completed yet? I don't think it has yet until the S and P goes below 4350, and then it's a reminder that if we do get below there and we follow through as I suggested, then it gives you a downside objective. And the general approach is to measure the height of the pattern and then subtract that from the neckline. So basically take the head to the neckline, you assume is similar sort of pattern. That's a classic uh, technical analysis approach of looking at the height of a base or of a pattern and then projecting that to give you a minimum objective. That gets you down to like the 4,100 level or so, um, which again, if you take a step back, if you think about it, that gets the S&P around its 200-day moving average, maybe a little bit below. Um, mm -hmm. Still, if you zoom out, probably a reasonable pullback 
given the rally that we've seen in the overvaluation and growth stocks, that actually could be the eventual end of this pullback phase here in the third into the fourth quarter could set us up for a, a pretty successful fourth quarter. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the general base case of the uh, of the markets, but it starts with these three phases and whether we can continue this distribution pattern for the S&P. Does volume uh, come into account here, especially when breaking the, the trend line? Such a good question, Arusha. And of course it does, right? So Edwards and McGinn, and, and, and that's been, you know, debated, I think, with a lot of my peers in the industry for quite some time. Um, you know, the earlier practitioners like Edwards, uh, like John McGee, in their books, they talk a lot about volume. Um, I would argue in 2023, volume, I think today means something very different than it did when they were writing their books. I mean, just the market structure is different. The participants are different. There weren't dark pools or high frequency trading or all of that. But in general, the general approach to volume in a pattern like this is you assume lighter volume through the pattern and then a big influx of, of, uh, of volume, which would validate the second and then the third phases, right? So what tells you there's follow through is it's not just a little blip driven by a small number of investors. It's a big sell. If it's a big distribution where people see that, they recognize it and they want to get out of the way as quickly as possible. So a spike in volume as you break the neckline would really complete that and put an exclamation point on that distribution pattern, I would say. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the confirmation part, that follow through. Mm -hmm. How much is enough? Is it one of those, you know it when you see it or yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, type things? Yeah. Uh, how do you know that it's, you know, because again, I, I think it's very easy yeah. for people to look at the trigger and be like, okay, this is, you know, it crossed my line, I'm in. But yeah, you know, that, so so different, you know, again, I think different people have very different approaches to it. And, you know, like a Tom DeMarc strikes me as someone who would have a certain number of days. He would say, all right, you need right. one or two days continuing in that direction. When I've talked with Larry Williams, it's more about a, a price movement. So you need to break a particular level. You know, you you make, a, you know, the breakdown and then you undercut that low by at least a tick or two. John Murphy, if I remember right, more general, talking about just you need follow through, you need some sort of additional confirmation. Um, other times you look for a percent move, right? I undercut that low by three to five percent, and that confirms that the distribution is happening. For me, I usually look at the day or two after that breakdown because I find that's usually a really crucial time. When you break down through a level, particularly a really clear technical pattern like this, a lot of people are going to see that, and a lot of people are going to be looking for that confirmation. And the moment you start to see further sell-offs after that initial break, that's when it can be a quick sort of waterfall decline. So for me, it's a day or two after that breakdown and looking for an additional low below the low of that of that breakdown day. Um, but again, I, I think to your point, uh, Justin, what's most important is that you have a risk management strategy. And I always tell people with technical analysis, there's so much attention and focus on finding the holy grail, right? Finding that one indicator on all you need to do is follow the signals. Mm -hmm. I've looked like it isn't there, but what you do have are you have signals that tend to work and the game isn't having a signal that works all the time. It's sticking with it when it does work and getting out of it when it doesn't work. And so I always tell people having an imperfect but consistent risk management process is way better than having a perfect but inconsistent process. So have a stop loss, right? Have some way that you define, OK, this pattern didn't work. I need to or, you know, this validation happened or it didn't. And then look to refine that over time. But make sure you have some way of of. Of, of recognizing when the market moves against the the call that you made. Are, are there more uh, ideal time frames? Like, because you can see the head and shoulders like on a five minute chart too, right? So, are are there kind of uh, what are kind of the 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 more significant time frames? I would say. So is? yeah, no, it's a good question, Rush. And I feel like with most of the financial industry, we as generally take a really good idea and then butcher it by trying to. <laughs> do all sorts of crazy things. It's not just technical analysts, it's, it's everybody. So yeah. if you look at, again, the original, you know, uh, you know, investors like Edwards and me and others, this is a multi-month, more of a longer term pattern. I think of it like a cup and handle pattern too, right? It's more of a, something that evolves over months, not over minutes. Yeah. Having said that, people try to apply this on all sorts of different timeframes. I think of this as more of a medium term, long term uh, type of pattern. Um, this is not something I would be looking at intraday. And, and, and the reason is because the main uh, point of this pattern was to look for broader distribution. And it was based on the fact that institutions were making significant changes in their portfolios. And again, when I think of, um, you know, some of the canceling methodology, thinking about institutional backing and the benefits of looking at relative strength and getting a sense of what money managers are doing as represented by the data, I think looking at patterns over a period of weeks to months 
is better than looking to you know minutes uh, uh, and doing a shorter term time frame. So for me, I think the the head and the head and shoulders pattern you're seeing on the S and P, I probably would go much shorter term than that. This is a pattern that's uh, you know emerging over a, a couple months, and I think that's a good a good general frame of reference to think about for something like that. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me that you know with with William O'Neill, the founder of Investors Business Daily, uh, his he would gravitate a lot towards weekly charts, partially because that's what he started with. That's what was available yeah. at the time. You know, there, there were these little um, these little books. They were very thin. You know, you could put in your back pocket, and that's what he walked around with uh, yeah. to kind of give him a, a sense of what the what the charts looked like. And of course, they only came out once a week, so you know, you'd have to wait <laughs> in order to kind of get that, or you had to you know do it yourself. You know, start yeah. drawing with a pen, and uh, you know, get, you know. T taking a look. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to kind of bring up here is, you know, you're talking about the head and shoulders and you're talking mm -hmm. about these distribution patterns, these tops. What about flipping it on the other side? Do you do you look for the same kind of thing, a setup, you know, a cup with handle, for instance, um, the trigger being that pivot point and then the follow through as well? Completely. And so I think on, on either side with any of those patterns and the ones that I tend to follow the most, head and shoulder reversals and, and tops and bottoms, I think are, are, are pretty relevant. Um, looking at any sort of basing pattern and a breakout um, and looking for that rotation from from something like uh, I'm trying to think of like an affirm AFRM maybe is a good example of that. Something that's been in sort of a longer term base, just starting to break above it here in the last uh, in the last couple of weeks or so. And if you look, I don't think it's enough to just say, OK, here's a level. You know, it, you think of it in the same levels with any sort of support and resistance. I think you think of those same three phases. Right. I've identified the resistance. Level. I've identified my potential entry point. That's the setup. Then the confirmation or th then the trigger is you actually break through the level and then the confirmation is that follow through. So you, do you see additional movements in that direction and being patient and waiting for breakouts? You know, again, I when I was reading you know, William O'Neill's books, right, I mean, the first book on, on, on how to buy stocks, you know, it, it was talking about being being comfortable buying strength. Right. You don't have to yeah. buy at the lows. You buy when things are starting to work. And I, I think a good technical approach that quantifies that and just looks for the level and identifies it. What's the trigger and then what's the follow through? Even just breaking through a resistance level like a firm, being patient for those breakouts, I think is, is so worth it. And otherwise you're jumping into things that aren't really the pattern that you think they are. Uh, so, so being patient is usually a pretty decent approach, I say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I almost even, even on the going back to the S&P 500, you had pr uh, so something close to a, an inverse head and shoulders here, right? And, yeah. And, uh, I mean, that, that 4,200, I mean, I know it went a little bit higher than the 4,325, but that yeah. 4,200 level was kind of a significant part. And once it got past it in May, that's when it took off. And now some of these projections, if this is a head and shoulder that's confirmed, the one that you went over to the downside, yeah. could come right back to that same level. Totally. And, and I would say, Arusha, a lot of people, and again, unfortunately, it's like you bring up a chart or, or a stock and you think, all right, is it a buy or a sell, right, at a given point? Should I buy it or sell it? The reality is on any given day, it may not, it may be telling you neither, right? It, sometimes it may say, wait, right? There's a time to hold, sit on your hands and just wait for the pattern to, to break out. That's why I think using alerts, I remember using uh, on MarketSmith doing the uh, screen for stocks making new relative highs and I'd flip through them every morning because I was just looking for a certain pattern. I'm not looking at every chart and saying, am I going to buy this or not? I'm looking for a pattern. When I would see it, I would say, yep, that's the that's the type of opportunity we're looking for. So thinking of kind of the idealized pattern and looking for stocks and ETFs that match it, that is far better than just trying to make something out of the, the, the charts that you see. And too often, I feel like we try to find opportunities that may not be available, right? We try to trade our way out of a, a period of bad performance, <laughs> right. be patient and wait for the opportunities that are more ideal. I think that's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to just kind of throw a monkey into this, uh, uh, a, a monkey wrench here. What is too waiting too long? You know, because we always mm. talk about, you know, being extended, you know, mm. and sometimes people will wait so long that it's like obvious and they're like, you know, they, they, they really want super confirmation. Like I want to, I want to feel comfortable that it's definitely going in that direction. And by the time they get that comfortable, it's too late. You know, the market's kind of moved on. So, so there, that's a great question, Justin. And I would say there are four things that are really tough as an investor and it happens to all of us buying too early, buying too late, selling too early, selling too late. None of those are particularly enjoyable. And I would hope you don't do that, but it happens to all of us, right? And so I think with something like, uh, you know, again, stocks that are rotating higher, I often find 
you know, we too often are looking for like an ideal chart, like a, you know, something like an alphabet that is making a new high, right? When something's mm -hmm. just making a new high after a run, it's pretty extended and it's hard for me to justify, is this the time to be pulling the trigger? So it's, it's thinking about the longer trend, but then recognizing what's the level, right? What's the opportunity that make, makes sense? On a chart like Alphabet, buying short-term weakness has been a pretty decent approach. And I'd be inclined to continue to do that until the chart tells me, tells me otherwise. What you don't want to do is, uh, and, and again, I would say the other thing is, I, I scan for stocks making new three-month highs and three-month lows. That's kind of the core of my stock picking process and ETF picking process. I used to look for stocks making new 52 week highs. And what happened was I would find all these charts that are really overextended. And it's like, I don't need to know the fact, like I know Alphabet's probably up a good amount. I'm looking again, not that a firm is the best example ever, but I mean, charts like that that are just starting to rotate higher. Energy stocks after they've been pulling down and then start to rotate. Gold stocks after they've been selling off here and just starting to rotate higher, which I think they may be doing. That's the opportunity. So, so recognizing where the the ideal sort of chart looks like for you, and then just looking for those opportunities as they as they come out, and then being courageous enough, or I guess bold enough, to just take action. And I think what you have to remember is waiting forever for an opportunity as the price goes up. What you have to remember is taking a position and just re relying and trusting on your money management process to unwind your position if it's not working anymore. That should give you confidence to take positions and make sure you're managing uh, position sizing so that you're not losing your sleep on any one any one position. I think if you do those sorts of things consistently, have a good, a well-defined process, you minimize the chance that you're uh, that you're avoiding really good opportunities and leaving them still on the table. So, mm -hmm. so David, well, so instead of the 52 week high, what were you, what were you saying? Was there a defined, was it, was there a defined high or was it each individual? Uh, so I tend to scan for stocks making new three month highs. And three I started ago. doing that years ago only because I found by waiting for stocks just at a new 12 month high, you often just found things that were, that had just been going up for a while. And then they, you know, they've been in a downtrend for a, a long time. They rotated higher and then they're going up, going up, going up. And then it hit my radar. And I'm like, yeah, I have a bunch of examples that are way too late. So what I'm normally trying to do is what I call a look for a change in character, right? Look for a yeah. stock that's in the distribution phase, meaning it's going down. It stops going down, which I would call kind of a bottoming phase or a consolidation phase. And then it's starting to rotate higher. And the things that mark that rotation are you make a new three month high, you make a higher low, you start to see, you know, uh, accumulation because you're above moving averages instead of below them. They're, below them, there, there are all these sort of rotational patterns that happen on the chart that tell you it was going down and now it's not. And so for me, three month highs gives me a good working list. And then I go through those just to review the patterns to see which ones are actionable right now. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use a three month relative strength? That's yeah. something we have in MarketSmith that I'll screen off of sometimes. Often. And, and I and I would yeah. say if there's one thing that I, I two things, having spent a lot of my career with institutional investors and now working a lot more with financial advisors and individual investors, two things that I find is the institutional investors do a lot of things not well, I would argue they're they're not perfect. So don't don't assume that they are. But two things that they do very well is number one, a laser focus on relative strength, mm -hmm. meaning you want to own things that are doing better than your benchmark and you want to not own things that are doing worse than your benchmark. And just doing that simple thing of looking, what I would love to do is look at your portfolio, look at your watch list and find the things where the relative strength line is really breaking down. Those are things you want to really question whether they deserve right. a spot in your portfolio. And since we're in the baseball season and our local Mariners are making a hopeful push to the postseason, I would say this. <laughs> if you're the Mariners and you want to beat the L.A. Dodgers, do you want to put your weaker players that are kind of struggling right now on the field, or do you want to put your top players that give you, you want to put your Julio Rodriguez top performers? I would argue you want your top performers right on the, on the, uh, on the field. And so why would you do anything less with your portfolio? So make sure you rotate out of names that are not working and rotate into names that are working three month relative highs. A great, I used to do that on markets with myself and just, and just look through that bucket and see if there were opportunities that I didn't know about beforehand. The other thing is just a great awareness of risk. I feel like individual investors often want all the upside and none of the downside, whether or not they say that or not that in their head, that's what they want. They want all the benefit, but then perfectly hedged. And yeah. any institutional investor will tell you that's obviously not ever going to happen. So it's all about recognizing potential return and potential risk. And by owning a stock or an ETF, I am taking on that additional risk for the possibility of greater return. And just thinking about acceptable levels of risk and what your tolerance is, is something I hope more individual investors 
uh, think about in their process. Okay. Well, this is awesome. Uh, I, I think uh, this is something that a lot of our folks will get a lot of value out of. Uh, and again, this is something for both markets that are going up and markets that are going down. So great stuff. When we come back, we're going to get into a little bit of the stocks that are on David Keller's radar. So stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. Trading Apple, sometimes you get the bear. Sometimes it gets you. Single stock daily leveraged and inverse ETFs from Direction. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's objectives, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus at Direction.com. Read carefully. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Paris, who joins me every week. He's a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. And we're welcoming back to the show, David Keller, CMT and Chief Market Strategist over at StockCharts.com. Uh, he has... Uh, a, a great show, final bar at the end of the, the market. And he also is doing this Q&A every Wednesday at 10 o'clock uh, um, Pacific time. Uh, what is that Eastern time? At three, one o'clock, uh, <laughs> one o'clock Eastern time. Um, but yeah, we're, we're both on Pacific. So it's okay to say 10, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays. Uh, some, some really great stuff that he's constantly sharing, uh, you know, his, his take on stuff. Definitely worth watching. And what about Twitter? Uh, you're, or X, I guess I should say. You're, you're pretty active on x as well what, what is your handle there yeah it's at d keller cmt yeah and you, you got some great pictures uh there uh some very casual ones uh I, I might add that i love love seeing um but let's go ahead and get into some stocks here um and you've mentioned you know the cyclicals and the energy and everything like that so why don't we go ahead and start with um murphy usa uh this is this is a little bit i mean they they sell they sell gas stations, but it's, uh, you know, they sell gas at gas stations, but it's also this kind of convenience store thing. Um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of Casey. You know, I, I think the Casey General stores are doing okay, but what, what's your take on Murphy USA? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I like, I mean, to, to put it simply, I like stocks that are going up and I, I don't mm -hmm. like stocks that are not going up. And I feel like too often we try to, try to complicate way, way more than that. And, and, you know, what I what I appreciate about a chart like MUSA is you have this rounded bottoming pattern. I'd, probably, I'd, I'd call this a cup and handle pattern is how I would yeah. probably label this. And if you look, it's just a classic, you know, rounded uh, pattern. After the rally uh, into the uh, peak sort of fourth, uh, fourth quarter of last year, sort of this nice rounded basing pattern. And, and just kind of classic, right? You see the distribution in the left half and then the accumulation you know, sort of in the uh, second quarter into the third quarter of this year, then you face that same resistance around, you know, 320, 325 or so. Retest tested that a couple of times and then finally just in the last uh, couple of weeks kind of breaking above there. These are the types of charts that I like to, you know, look for. I like to scan for stocks that are testing previous highs. And if I can see something like this, I feel like it's a gift the market is providing back to you because it's showing you that there's a clearly established resistance level. And going back to our earlier conversation about, you know, patterns and being patient, you know, I think seeing a resistance level, a lot of times we get a little too eager and we think, all right, it's, it's nearing this level. I should probably buy now. I don't think you need to do that. I think it's worth being patient and waiting for a chart like uh, Murphy to break higher. And that's what you've seen here in the, uh, in the, uh, in the month of September. So in my, in my mind, when you have a stock like this that's had a consolidation pattern after a good run, and then you finally resolve to the upside, it just suggests that there's so much further upside to be had. And there's something I learned from you know studying O'Neill's work, probably not nearly as much as I know you guys have been able to do, just recognizing how strength tends to beget further strength. And if you look at right. the you know momentum factor and all of the literature, the academic research that backs up why technical analysis should add value, it's charts like this that are in the back of my mind, right? Something that the market has agreed is in a certain range and then something's different. So while I may not be super you know, familiar with the reasons why uh, you know, investors are accumulating MUSA, the chart is telling me that there's good accumulation. I'd be inclined to follow that. And I like the improvement in relative strength more than anything. I think that's mm -hmm. an encouraging uh, sign, recognizing this is stock that's thriving when the markets overall are in a you know, somewhat of an uncertain period. So mm -hmm. when you say relative strength, you're looking at the relative strength line, right? The stock versus that benchmark. Absolutely right. And, and again, with, with my time with institutions, we would spend a lot of time thinking about relative strength. 
selfishly probably because that's how we were paid. We're evaluated based on our ability to outperform the benchmark. So watch how quickly people focus on something. If <laughs> yeah. That is your main source of, uh, of value, according to the firm, is your ability mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to outperform. But, you know, I think it's a very simple thing, right? I mean, if you want to have a strong performing portfolio, it needs to be constructed of strong performing stocks. And, uh, you know, Peter Lynch, I, I, I can, I can uh, quote uh, Peter uh, many times probably in a, in a discussion, but, you know, he would always say, if you are cutting your winners and holding your losers, it's like you're cutting your flowers and letting your weeds grow in your garden, right? If you want to have a thriving garden, which we are certainly trying to do in Western Washington right now, my wife and I, we're trying to encourage the things that we want to grow to grow. And so, you know, finding strong charts that are getting stronger, in my opinion, that's the game. And having a continuous process pointed me to MUSA as I was looking for stocks setting up with the potential cup and handle pattern. I think it's uh, it's resolved to the upside pretty well. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, about, you know, in relation to your phases, you know, so I think, you know, the, the pattern is pretty clear, you know, whether you look at that cup with handle, um, you know, in both cases, uh, you know, it seems like this came, you know, whether it was the cup with handle or this most recent pattern that it came out of, in both cases, it kind of came right up to the line, right up to that, you know, level. And I should mention that we've seen a lot of stocks doing this, and mm -hmm. then they just kind of fizzle or they, they, they briefly get above that line and then they, you know, they turn tail. But no. uh, it seems like Murphy USA in both cases really had power as it came through that line. So does that count as the trigger and the follow through when it's like able to, you know, not just kind of break above it in the morning, but stay above it and close well? Or do you, do you really want that extra day? I love that question, uh, particularly when you're talking about the closes and even just today, right? We had the Fed meeting. So charts looked a very certain way. And then from 2.30 to 4 p.m. Eastern, a lot of charts changed very, very quickly. You know, the, the, the current bar looked very, very different. And so I think recognizing that waiting for a close really tells you where the market nets out, right? At the end of the day, where do we actually get to? And that's why things like candlestick analysis are really built on the relationship between the open and the close. Where do we start? Where do we end? And I think on a daily time frame, on a weekly time frame, that has a lot of relevance. So for me, closing through the level is the first point, right? So just trading above a resistance level is not is not enough. You need to show that we're actually closing above there, which tells you there's no selling coming in to the end of the day. There's no investor saying, great, I'm glad we broke out. Now, thank God I can get out of my position. <laughs> you want to see further accumulation. And then for me, it's the follow through day or the follow through bar, the next bar, making sure we kind of continue higher. And I think that's what's most encouraging about a chart like MUSA. It's not just that initial resistance and then the breakout of the pattern. It's additional accumulation, which shows you pretty much anyone that bought so far, there's a, either additional buyers coming in or there's additional buying power that's pushing the price higher. That's encouraging. Yeah, and also to go, I mean, we had a tough day today, right? The the S and P was down almost a percent. Nasdaq was down one and a half percent, and here's uh, Murphy USA up more than a percent. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what problem? Looking, looking for those outliers, the, you know, the, the market's down. What's actually fighting that trend? Often a really interesting list. I mean, not not a guaranteed buy list, but certainly a working list. I would be reviewing on any kind of distribution day. Look for the things that are actually holding up. That shows where people are rotating despite the broader market uh, indecision. Mm -hmm. uh, let's turn our attention because you mentioned it earlier, Alphabet. Uh, it's, it's one of those stocks that just has been um, of the Magnificent Seven. This has even acted differently in that it held above its 50 day moving average line. Yeah. It was just not, you know, not coming down. Uh, now, granted, it had a little bit of an ugly day today, but what's your take on Alphabet here? So what I like about a chart like Alphabet is, is again, it's the longer term trend, kind of that medium term trend, right? If you look at the last, uh, you know, year and a half, two years, you can see a clear rotation, right? From weakness in the third and fourth quarter of last year, a clear rotation to a period of accumulation. We are below a 200 day moving average, then we're above it. We're below downward sloping moving averages. Now we're above upward sloping moving averages. We keep making higher highs and higher lows. We pull back to a 50 day moving average and then make a new swing high. These are all the characteristics, in my opinion, of leading stocks that are continuing to uh, to go higher. Um, you know, the challenge for a chart like Alphabet is that it stops going up. And I get a lot of people looking at a chart like this and saying, well, hold on. Is it too late? You know, why would you why would you want to buy something like this? And I think, you know, market history is filled with good charts that have gotten better. Right. So, you know, looking for good, strong charts. 
ideally pulling back a little bit has been sort of a, a good uh, good opportunity. So I'm a big fan of you know charts that are making higher highs and higher lows, some short term weakness or something pulling back to an ascending 50 day or a 10 week moving average. That's kind of the sweet spot. So you know, a stock like Alphabet pulling back uh, on a day like today, I don't think that's unreasonable given the fact that you know broader market conditions you know sort of questioned after the uh, the Fed meeting and Powell's press conference, but you know, overall, it's not whether a stock pulls back because that's going to happen. Some of the biggest mm -hmm. down days happen in bullish phases, right? That's just the nature of volatility. What's really important is to look at the low, right? As long as we keep making a higher low, the conditions are still OK. And when I when we had Ralph Akinpour in recently, it's one of the things that he pointed out. It's like it's in an uptrend. It's not about the highs. It's about the lows, right? We're going to pull back. Do we keep, you know, keep gaining ground to the upside? And, and the higher lows are what tells you that that's that's happening. And that, I think, is what differentiates a chart like Alphabet from others. The Magnificent Seven, I would say, uh, earlier this year felt like a group of stocks that were all kind of doing the same thing. Yeah. Now we're starting, you know, Netflix does not look like the chart of Alphabet, right? And Tesla looks very different. Apple, some of these names that have gapped lower and now putting in lower highs, very different takes. So I think recognizing that this is not one bucket of stocks necessarily, but a group of individual companies with very different, you know, implications of higher rates and consumer behavior. I like sticking with charts that are working. And I think out of that group of, you know, seven names, Alphabet's probably the one that I would, uh, I would take a shot at if I, if I had had the opportunity. So going off of with Alphabet, like, so it is pulling back here. Mm -hmm. What would be kind of a, a point? I, I know we're in a market correction, but just going, looking at this in a vacuum, what would, Oh, you'd be looking for to potentially start buying it. Would you be looking for an upside reversal or, or are you just yeah. buying a, a, on, on a pullback? Yeah, so I, I think it's a really good point. I, and you mentioned sort of the macro theme. I, you know, I when I look at sort of the big picture, I, I definitely think the M and the canceling makes a ton of sense. And recognizing that there are times when you want to be looking for new opportunities, there are times when you there are times when you want to focus on growing capital, and there are times when you want to focus on preserving capital. And I think that's a hundred percent true. So I think you're seeing enough distribution, particularly if the S and P follows through on that you know, on a, on a head and shoulders top, I think that certainly would suggest to me, you want to be thinking more risk off, if at all, at least in the short term, until things uh, become a little more stable. But overall, I would argue it's always a good time to own good charts. And I, I think of some of the negative years that I've experienced as an investor, picking up the IBD every morning at the newsstand in New York, there always seem to be charts going up, right? They're yeah. out there. They might just be way more plentiful or way less plentiful. And so, you know, a chart like Alphabet, despite the fact that I think the market conditions are getting less optimal for risk assets, there are charts that are looking pretty good. And so I think rotating to names and patterns that are constructive, that are outperforming, which I would say Alphabet certainly uh, has been doing, as long as that continues, I think you're, you're pretty good. A pullback is really ideal. And, and, and again, too, with another baseball analogy, I think of, a strong uptrend and then a pullback. You call that the fat pitch chart. And if mm -hmm. you don't know baseball, that's a pitch that the pitcher just leaves hanging right over the plate. You have to take a swing. It was just such a good setup. And so for me, a long-term uptrend, pulling back to an ascending 50-day moving average, that would be the sweet spot. So I think Alphabet goes down a little bit further. You often represents a, an opportunity to buy a really good company at a bit of a discount. We start breaking the recent swing low. We don't hold the 50-day moving average, you know, alphabet, something like 127, that recent swing low. We start to not hold that level. That's where I would think, okay, buying on the dips, maybe not the strategy, and I want to be a little more defensive. But, you know, th these are charts that have pulled back many times on the way up and overall have held. I'd be inclined to assume that that continues until the chart tells me otherwise. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, speaking of maybe a, a stock that is potentially having a change in character, let's take a look at Celsius, uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, this is, again, one of the one of the stocks that's been in this very solid uptrend. Uh, really, again, when the market's been pulling back, it's like Celsius doesn't care. It's like, you know, what what market pressure? Um, but today it seemed like it it kind of suffered a bit, you know, down eight percent. And look, it's just one day and it's not even to the 50 day moving average line yet. But is this enough of a change of character that you think, hey, something's going on? Yeah, so a name like Celsius has been on my list, and, and mainly it was this basing pattern, right? If you look at the second half of last year, first half of this year, a nice gap uh, you know, above on, uh, on earnings, and then just continued. I think gaps can be so helpful, usually for a stock happens around earnings, and recognizing how that is a, a change in valuation, right, from 
one day's close to the next day's open, people all of a sudden are feeling that this is a different opportunity than it was the previous day. But then the additional accumulation, look how we gapped higher and then we held that level. We never even tested the upper end of that gap, really. And that shows you that additional demand has come in. People are thrilled about owning more and more Celsius as it goes uh, as it goes higher. So I think it was a really encouraging breakout. And I think breaking out of that base, pretty significant. The challenge for a chart like uh, Celsius after, you know, it's had the run that it has and it's been, you know, a double after, you know, sort of forming that base uh, not too long ago. The problem is it becomes overextended, right? From the language of technical analysis, say it's overbought. If you're more mm -hmm. fundamentally oriented, it's overvalued, right? It's relative to where it should be. It's higher than normal. We think of it as leaning a little too far above, uh, 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 over its skis. Mm -hmm. And that's OK, right? In a normal uptrend, you're going to have some of these corrective uh, corrective moves. I always mention, Arusha, you and, you and I were talking, you look for what I call a change of character, right? The chart has a certain look and then something's different. For me, the 50-day moving average is often just sort of that base case. And I always look for, I scan for stocks that have been above their 50-day moving average and all of a sudden they are not anymore because that tells me something's different. Same thing, I look for things that are below their 50-day moving average or their 200-day moving average and now they're finally breaking above it. Well, that's not necessarily my, you know, my standard buy list. It gives me a list of names that are changing, right? Something is evolving and I want to make sure I recognize that. So something like Celsius, I think long term, the trend is still positive. So I think if you think of the bigger time frame, it's still OK. But for me, this is where I immediately put it on a watch list. And I have an alert that says when it breaks the 50 day, I need a slap in the face to at the very least reconsider the position to think about taking some off. And, uh, and recognizing that there's enough weakness that I need to take action. And I, and I would also say, guys, I, I think a lot of times uh, as investors, we think way too much in binary uh, outcomes, right? I either own 100% or I own zero. Yeah, right? right. yeah. There's a whole bunch of levers you can pull, right? You can take a partial position. You can use options. You can do a protective put. You can find ways to gain premium if there's periods of instability. So recognizing that there's enough of a change on a chart like Celsius that you may want to think about ways to manage that downside risk. I think that's what a breakdown would would tell me. So I think the 50 days are a really good thing to watch on a name that, again, a name that's been one of the better charts in 2022. Mm -hmm. Now, not to throw a, a, another monkey wrench in here, but uh, this, this could open up a can of worms. Uh, do you ever use precedent? I mean, because of course, a lot of people are looking at Celsius and they're like, hey, I remember this stock called Hanson Natural. Uh, now it's called Monster uh, because they you know, had to change their name because what they came up with as their best selling product was anything but natural. Um, so you know, they, they changed it. Um, you know, so do, do, you, do you ever look at a precedent like this and say, oh, this, this is what's possible. This is, you know, this is what captures the imagination. And or are people looking at that too much and maybe, you know, uh, getting getting too excited about that unnecessarily? No, I, I think what you have to remember, and again, I think of a, a book by John Markman called uh, Fast Forward Investing, really deals with big picture themes, right? There are certain themes that well after you and I and uh, the three of us and, and others are probably no longer hopefully actively investing and just enjoying the, the fruits of that career spent doing what we're doing, there will be themes that we will still that will have been, you know, key bullet points in our career and things like artificial intelligence, obviously, driverless vehicles, clean energy, um, you know, water. These are things that we will be figuring out for quite some time. You know, the recent history is certainly filled with, you know, this particular area, which is beverages, particularly non-alcoholic beverages, which have become much more of a of a focus. You're seeing a lot more, uh, you know, coverage of sobriety and, and other alternatives. And so that theme has happened. But what you know, Markman's book tells you is just because a theme is going to work, just because you, you, you're pretty sure AI or blockchain or whatever is going to be a, a good theme, just because you think that maybe uh, other beverages other than alcohol may become more prevalent, which stocks and which companies actually will benefit from that is the real yeah. difference. So <laughs> I think what a chart of Monster shows you is that a name like this playing on this theme worked. But I think the chart showed you, you know, not at the end, it showed you earlier on that this was a theme that was working and continued to build. So I think that is a precedent of a space where there's opportunity and recognizing other names that are able to play on that larger theme. I think 100% makes, uh, makes a ton of sense. So other areas that I mentioned, I think those are longer term themes, but look for actionable ideas, you know, viable bases and breakouts within companies that have exposure there. That's where the opportunity really lies. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, it, as you said earlier, it comes down to the chart, right? You know, you can have the greatest idea, but if the chart is not going up, the price is not, you know, confirming that thesis, that idea, then then what are you doing? And it, relative strength is a great thing to look at there. So a lot of very good points there, David. Thank you so much. Um, and it was really great having you on the show again. Uh, Always great to talk to you. Again, people can uh, go to your YouTube channel that you have. You've got some great stuff on your YouTube channel. Uh, follow you on X, formerly known as Twitter, at D Keller. Um, and also, uh, gosh, you, you have so much great stuff. So Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com. Thanks a lot for coming on, David. No, I appreciate it. Justin Arusha, thanks again for the invite. People should know how much fun you guys have doing the show. You guys, you laugh and smile a lot. It's a pleasure to spend some time with you. Thank you. Yeah, they don't call him, call him Mr. Smiles for nothing. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll see you next time. We'll definitely have you on again. Sounds Let's good. Guys. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for us this show. Next week, it's going to be Arusha and I all on our own. We're going to get a little bit of we time. And hey, I should also mention that, you know, because uh, Arusha, actually, he does have this other job, apparently, and that other job pays him. So he's going to be out in Boston. We're going to do our show a little bit earlier. So be looking for that to drop on Tuesday morning. We're going to do the taping on Monday. So it's going to be a little bit early uh, to, to accommodate Arusha's other job. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, showing up every, every week there, Arusha. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.